my name is uh, James Trevette, and I'm here basically to do some teaching tonight. And uh, I tried to come up with a title, so I sort of made a... The title is The Beast of the Revelation, Brexit, and the 2016 Election. Uh, you're saying, okay, we're going to cover this. So I want to talk a little bit about this because things are changing rapidly in this world, you can tell, but uh, the fact is God does have this under control. And as I've discussed before, Peter seemed to have a little trouble with the fact that Jesus was going to be crucified. And so he began to talk about this. I said, no, Lord, that's a lousy plan. Uh, we're not going to do that. But it was a perfect plan. And even in these days, we don't want to find ourselves fighting against the very plan of God. We want to follow with the plan of God. Because He has a purpose and a direction. And His plans and His ways are perfect. As strange as they look and as strange as they sound. So we just want to understand what it is we should do. So many people are out there praying for this. Well, let's go kill the Antichrist and all these things. Well, you know, that's really not going to work. Because what's written is written. So the question is, how do we look at the things? So I'm going to look at some things today. About once a year or so, I'll talk a little bit about a prophetic update. And this is somewhat that. So I'm going to be talking about the beast of the revelation and how it relates to what's going on right now. Revelation 13, it describes the beast. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea, and it had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on the horns, and each head had a blasphemous name. So here's the beast of the revelation. Notice it says it comes out of the sea. Now, what does that mean? In Revelation, what does the sea represent? The people, right? The people of the world, the many people of the world. So this dragon, this beast is coming out of the peoples of this world. And I've got a picture here of it, and a little bit dramatic, but, uh, but basically it has, as it says, uh, ten horns and seven heads. But what does that mean? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the beast, and this is from past teaching. I didn't want to go into the details this time. But from the scriptures, I showed before that the beast is made up of people, possibly multinatural and multicultural people. That the beast is a government that will gain power to rule over all of the earth. The beast is Antichrist. I would say he's the Antichrist, but it's not really true. A beast can be a kingdom, not just a person. Beast hates the people of God and will turn all the governments of the nations against them. It says you'll be hated by all nations. That's governments. Not everybody in the world, just the governments. To understand the beast, you need to understand the dragon, because the dragon is the motivation of the beast. And Satan does not want to be like God, right? He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped. The beginning of the beast can be traced back to the beginning of man and man's government in Genesis. And this is many places, but the, probably the easiest way to see it is, is in Babylon. God declares the end from the beginning. And as you saw the picture in Babylon, where they came together to build a tower, the devil had convinced them to do this. Now his plan was to have mankind build this great tower for themselves. And then once they got it built, he was going to come in and sit on top of it to rule the world. Right? I'm going to exalt my throne above the clouds and so on to fulfill his own prophecy. So the Lord confused all the languages and scattered them so they didn't build the Tower of Babel. But what's happened today? How about, is the, has the languages, are they still keeping us apart? You see, we now have an internet, and we have a situation where the world is coming back together. So what do you think the world's going to do? Rebuild Babylon, exactly. And that's because God declares the end from the beginning. So, this was the, Satan's plan from the beginning, but God also is allowing this tower to be built this time. This time it will be built. And this time the devil will step in on top. And this time he will rule the world. The strategy of Satan is to deceive man through the beast into building his own throne over all the nations. He wants a one world order so he can rule. So he's got a plan. 
But God has a plan also. So Revelation 17 also talks about the beast. This calls uh, for a mind with wisdom. I hope we got some of that here. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. Now, there is a place that's called the, basically the, the, the city of seven hills, and that's what? Rome, right? So it's very possible that he's talking about the woman, and a woman in Revelation represents what? There are three women in Revelation, right? There's the harlot, the beast, there's the bride, and there's Israel. So they're all like the church, if you will, one of them being the false. There's also seven kings. So here's your seven heads. Five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a while. So if you look at these, these seven kings or seven heads, what we'll see is they come in order. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Rome is the sixth one. It says five have fallen, five are in the past, one is, and this is the book of Revelation. When it was written, what empire was in charge? Rome. So that's where the one that is, is Rome. So there's one left. And he says that will be the new Roman Empire or the world empire. And you'll see that it represents the ten horns, and we're going to go through that. The ten horns represent ten countries of the new Roman Empire or ten world regions. And we're going to cover that. Because the beast really isn't some big monster. It's not uh, the big monster that's going to come out of the sea like a Japanese horror movie. It, this, the scripture clearly tells you what it is. That it is a government that's coming forth. Well, Daniel also talks about this. And in Daniel it says... Uh, if we look at, in Daniel 2, it talks about a world empire statue in a vision. He said, the head of the statue is made of gold, the breast of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. He continued looking until a stone that was cut without hands, and it was made, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all crushed at the same time. So all these past empires and the things that's ruled them were all crushed at once. In other words, he's destroying all of the old world empires. He goes on to say at the end, But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So that is the government of Jesus Christ, right? Well, Notice that there's also in these statues, if you look at the statue, it lines up very well with the seven empires and, or the seven heads. The difference is there's only five because when Daniel, where was Daniel when he got the vision? He's in Babylon, wasn't he? Well, Babylon was the third kingdom, so he's taking it from Babylon. So Babylon is the head, silver, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, the iron legs, and then the final empire, which has the ten toes, which represents also the ten horns. So notice that the two, the legs and the feet, both have iron in them. One of them is solid iron, and the other is iron mixed with clay. Well, I believe what we're talking about here is a revived Roman Empire, but actually it's a world government. The iron is, the, is definitely the Roman Empire, but I believe that very possibly the clay could be the rest of the world joined in to make a world government. Because obviously, where does the stone strike? What part of the statue? Right, right there at the feet. And as time goes on, this is time as we go down through here, so right in the last day, the destruction is coming in the last day, even though it takes down the entire statue. It strikes right there at the feet. That's when the Lord destroys the, anti, the government of the Antichrist. So Daniel's vision of the statue destroyed by Jesus also lines up with Revelation. So what I'm showing you is that Revelation and Daniel are basically showing the same beast and the same thing. This was in, and I'll show you why this is important. 
So if we go back to Daniel and we begin to look at the beast in Daniel, this is in now in Daniel 7. So we talked about the statue and how it lines up with Revelation. Now let's look at the beast. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up a great sea. Here we go with the, what's the sea? The people. And what's happening to the people? They're being what? Churned up. By what? Wind. wind. What is wind in the spirit. spirit? Right. Because pneuma, roar, the word also means breath or wind can mean spirit. So can you see what's going on right now? Are we really in that time where we can see that the winds are just churning up the sea, the people? Well, four great beasts, each one different from the other, came out of this sea. And there it is coming out of the sea again, the people. But let's look at these four beasts. The first was like a lion. It had wings of an eagle. I watched as its wings were torn off and it was lifted on the ground. And I'm, we're going to go through these in detail, so you don't have to study this too much. As a matter of fact, I'll just cover them. The first was a lion. The second was a bear. The third was a leopard. And then the fourth beast was different from the others. And it was, it's one with the ten horns. So let's look at those and see what they look like. If indeed these are the last days, then we're going to be able to see these beasts because what these beasts are are kingdoms and governments. And I believe it's going to tell us a whole lot about where we are right now. So let's start from the look at them. Here's the beasts of Daniel. The first thing you notice is there's four beasts here, right? Just as they described, and here's a picture of them. But if you look at these, you'll notice that these represent now how many heads are there in these four beasts. Okay, we can count them, right? There's one. And the, the first beast had one head. The second beast had one head. The third beast had four heads. And then the last one had one head. So how many do we have? Seven heads. Now how many horns do we have? No horns, no horns, no horns, and ten horns. So now we have a beast that just happens to have seven heads and ten horns. Sound familiar? So... The four together represent the one beast in the Revelation. Can we see that? It'll get clearer as we go. These great beasts, which were four in number, were four kings or kingdoms who are going to rise from the earth, from the sea. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. That's the stone that strikes and takes the thing apart. That's the Lord. That these are kingdoms that exist, but we are going to have the ultimate kingdom. So where are we with these beasts? Are these something that we're just going to see that's going to come, come out of the, uh, like a monster? No, I don't think so. I think they exist now, and I'll show you why as we look. Daniel 7, I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The beast that was slain is actually the fourth beast. And we're going to look at that. The fourth beast was the one that was slain. Remember, the stone hit the feet that represented the ten toes. So which one do you think he hit? The one with the ten horns. The fourth beast was being destroyed, if you read in Daniel. But what about the th other three beasts that were here in Daniel? The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In other words, all four of these beasts had to exist simultaneously when the Lord returns. They will all be here on the earth. Therefore, as they operate together, they become the beast with seven heads and ten horns. It's really made up of four beasts. The destruction is going to go on the one, the fourth beast, but the other three will continue around even into the millennium. So who are these that are going to continue into the millennium? And must these be around now? I would say we ought to be pretty close to having all of these things operating right now. Wouldn't you say? As we're getting that close. 
Well, let's look and see. Daniel's beasts must all exist at the time of the return of Christ. Back to Revelation 13. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw the beast coming out, the ten heads and the seven horns. So we can now see that the, the beast of the Revelation is actually the four beasts of Daniel, all existing at the time of the return of Christ, working together. But we can see the details of the individual beasts here in Daniel. And let's look at that. Let's start with one here. And the dragon, this is in Revelation, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and saw the beast coming out. He had ten horns and seven heads. I saw the beast resembled a leopard, but had feet like a bear, mouth like a lion, and a dragon gave the beast its power. So now can you see in Revelation, he's actually taking the characteristics of the other four beasts and putting them in there. It says that the beast resembled a leopard in the way that it managed. It had feet like a bear in the way that it conquered. It had a mouth like a lion. But the dragon gave the power to the beast. So that is in Revelation talking about the beasts. So I'm going to show you a little bit about these beasts and what they represent now today. And I think it'll show us what's happening in our political environment. The beasts of Daniel do line up. With, and we're going to talk about what these beasts are. So let's just talk, let's just start the very first one. The first was like a lion. Now let's even assume that they come in order, okay, in the last day. So the, it says the first was like a lion. So where was the, the greatest kingdom of the earth, maybe two, three hundred years ago, was what? The British Empire. The sun never set on the British Empire. The symbol for Britain is a lion. So let's look at this. The first was like a lion. It had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted up from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given it. So the beast, I believe, was Britain, the British Empire. Obviously, the wings that were torn off of it were what? The eagle. But the eagle stood up on its own and had the heart of a man, which is different than a beast. It was a different form of government, not there to destroy and to conquer. It was given the heart of a man. So, gee, who can that be? Is it really clear that what he's talking about here is Britain and then basically the United States being freed from Britain? Now, if they would have understood this before, they would have seen what was happening. Maybe they did, and that's why we're an eagle. But that's not the way things work. They probably didn't understand that that's what was happening. So the first beast, England, and of course we were separated from it. So that means that the United States is going to be around at the return of Christ. Okay, we good? Let's look at some news. Britain votes for the Brexit in a historic referendum. Britain's voted to leave the European Union. It raises questions as to the future of Prime Minister David Cameron. So as we know, this just happened in late June, right? Now, why would that happen, biblically? They were a part of the European Union. But is that what this is showing us? The, it looks to me like the beast joined together. Because it's still considered one beast here even though it has the wings of the, of the eagle and the body of the lion. Well, if we're going to separate from the European Union, what's next? Well, it turns out the very day that they separated, Donald Trump, the day of the vote, Donald Trump happened to be there at his new Turnberry property there, and he was interviewed. He says, I think it's a great thing that just happened. People are angry all over the world. They're angry. He says, Trump had expressed support for the Brexit in the past. On Friday, he likened the voter's decision in the UK to the US presidential election. People want to take their country back and have independence. 
They want to take their borders back. They want to take their monetary back. They want to take lots of things back. They want to be able to have a country again. Just happen to be there. Well, it turns out Cameron did resign. And let's see who came in. A lady named Theresa May, who is a conservative, but she's considered a liberal conservative. But even as that, she's very strong in dealing with immigration and trying to limit immigration. But let's see what she said. She said, I'm going to make you three pledges. This is on July 12th, so this is not old. <laughs> it's two days ago. First pledge. We need a bold, new, positive vision for the future of our country. A vision of a country that works for everyone, not just a privileged few. In other words, even the blue-collar workers would support her. What else did she say? Second, we need to unite our party and our country. Third, our country needs strong, proven leadership to stir us through the times of economic and political uncertainty and to negotiate the best deal for Britain. Any of this sounded familiar to you guys? <laughs> to forge a new role for ourselves in the world. That's what she promised this week. So can you see anything starting to happen here? Is this biblical? Can you see that Britain was involved with the EU, but now is saying, well, wait a minute, we're going to separate from the EU, so where are they going to go? Well, it probably depends on who the next president is, right? Key Brexit figure, Farage, to attend the GOP convention. So it's, it turns out that the guy that started the whole Brexit thing has been invited to the RNC convention in Cleveland. He said, he had to make a statement, he said Obama had argued that the country should remain in the bloc, saying that leaving it would cause the UK to go to the back of the queue or the line as a trading partner. You remember when Obama went over and said that to support the union? So can you see here what's going on? Trump enthusiastically praised the nation's vote to leave the EU, saying the British took their country back. He says, I'm not going to endorse anybody. He says, I've already gotten in trouble by making a comment on uh, President Obama. But I do know a lot of people in the Republican Party, and I'll be interested to hear what Donald Trump has to say in his speech. So can you see a possibility here? that what's going to happen to Britain? Well, if they're going to need somebody to join with, who does it look like they're going to try to join with? Back to the European Union or with America? Interesting, isn't it? Let's look at the second beast. And there was before me a second beast which looked like a bear. And it was raised up on one of its side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of fresh flesh. Now, who's the bear? Right, we all know that Russia's the bear, right? I mean, isn't that who they are, their symbol? Everybody calls them the, the Russian bear? Well, you see, that came about after the United States because it was the early, what, the early 1900s when they actually came together as Russia and in the revolution and so on. So now there's a new beast in town, and it's a bear. And it's taking territory. As a matter of fact, it took the whole Eastern Bloc. I believe that's the ribs in its mouth. And I believe that's the side that was raised up. Because the other side toward China hasn't done much of anything. But the one toward the European side has definitely been raised up. And is even now trying to, to take territory. So let's say the second beast is Russia, which is also going to exist in the last days. Let's go on to the next one. And after that, the third beast, I looked and there before me was another beast, the one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. By the way, the translation of that is not like a bird, it's like a fowl. It specifically says that in the Greek translation. 
The beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. Remember? Let's talk about who this thing is. So there's the leopard. It's got its four wings. The leopard is basically, I believe, Germany. As a matter of fact, the big battle tank for the European Union built by Germany is called the leopard tank. And if you remember, they, I think they had the tiger and the leopard back during World War II. But uh, the way that they struck in World War II, they were likened unto a leopard. So basically, Germany represents the leopard. But it had the wings of a fowl on its back. Gee, what country has a symbol as a rooster? Right? France. It had, remember the French rooster? You always see it in the kitchen, right? The rooster? As a matter of fact, in the, for the 2016 soccer tournament uh, there in France, they use it as their emblem. So that means that France and Germany are going to be joined together just like the U.S. and Britain are joined together. So, it's interesting because it's given authority to rule. Now remember, where, where, where was the iron? The iron represented who? The Roman Empire, right? The power to rule. That's Europe. They've been given power to rule over the earth. Remember, the sun never set on the the British Empire, but now Europe itself is separating here. And I believe it's separating biblically. Notice it had four heads. Well, you remember the heads represented different uh, empires, one right after another, and the other beast. Well, let's look at the four heads of Germany and Europe. Well, it turns out that there's what's called a Reich which is when they attempted to unite uh, Europe in what they'll call the Holy Roman Empire. The first one was Charlemagne around 800, who was crowned by the Pope, which made it the Holy Roman Empire. The second was basically World War I, the Imperial Reich. The third Reich was Germany. And it turns out a fourth Reich could easily be considered the European Union. Notice both French and German monarchs considered the kingdoms descendant of Charlemagne. That would be, of course, the leopard and the fowl. So can you see the reichs here representing the different heads of the empire, with the fourth one being the critical one, which is the one now. But it's the same thing repeating itself. Now notice that it does make it the Holy Roman Empire because the pope's involved. And where is the pope? In Rome, Italy, the city of the seven hills. So has Britain avoided a super state? So this is from June 27th, right after the Brexit. It's funny, they didn't mention this before the Brexit. But there was a plan, and is a plan, afoot. France and Germany draw up plans to morph the EU countries into one control over member armies and economies. France and Germany reported to have drawn up a super state plan. It would mean members give up armies and economic powers to the EU. They didn't mention that before the Brexit vote, did they? Report leaked in Poland where it had been branded not the solution, but leaders of Germany, France, and Italy? Now what Italy got to do with it? The powers in France and Germany, but who's Italy? The Holy Roman Empire. Do you notice that how Italy just keeps showing up in World War I, in World War II, where was Italy? They just keep seeming to tie in with the Germans. Plans for a closer European Union have been branded an attempt to create a European super state. Germany's foreign minister, Frank Steinmeier, and his French counterpart today presented a proposal for the closer EU integration based upon the three key areas, internal and external security, the military, the migrant crisis, and economic cooperation. Total control. And this was June 27th. This was two days ago from the Times. The German military prepares to shape a new world order. 
Germany is preparing to emerge from 70 years of post-war restraint to play a greater military role on the world stage. Push for Germany to play a leading role in the European defense and in NATO. Can you see the legs of iron now? And the teeth of iron? That's obviously giving authority to rule. That's the European Union, which is led by Germany with, of course, France on its back, naturally but Germany carrying it. So can you see how these are lining up in the world now? And after that by vision at night, I looked and there was before me the fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. So that means that whatever this world order that the EU is building is going to present teeth for this new world government. Can you see that? It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. Trampled underfoot, remember it had feet like a bear. It was different from all the former beasts. Why is it different? Do you see, is the, is the, European, is, is the um, UN for instance, is it different than the United States? Yeah. What country is the United Nations? Do you see what it is? It's not a country. Right. It's a different kind of beast. It's not ruled by the territory. What it does is it sets up a governmental control, hence the ten horns. So it is a world government. But notice they're joined together. So apparently, Britain and the US, the EU, and Russia are all involved in supporting this world government, or at least and possibly controlled by it. Because if you'd read in Revelation, it says when this, or Daniel, when it says when the small horn comes up, it does pluck out three horns. And if those horns just happen to be the US, Russia, and whatever, so we don't know, it, they may take it by force over the, the rest of the countries. But this is what we're talking about, this beast, and that's the world order. That's the new world order that's coming, which is based, of course, off of the UN model. But it gives it, obviously, military, iron teeth, and economic control because they're able to stop you from buying and selling. In Daniel, this was in Revelation. Oh, no, excuse me, Daniel 7. This is in Daniel 7.23. And he gave me this explanation, the angel did. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear upon the earth, in other words, a fourth government. It will be different from the other ones, which it is, but it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. There's your new world order. The devil steps in when Babylon is rebuilt. Babylon represents world government. You know that, right? Okay. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed. We looked at that. So when Jesus comes, he destroys the world government, but he does not destroy the government of the European Union. He doesn't destroy the government of the United States, and he doesn't destroy the government of Russia. Remember? The others have been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. That makes sense. Well, let's shift a little bit and talk about something called the Middle East or Madrid Quartet. Have you ever heard of it? That is the body that for almost 10 years now has been negotiating the peace treaty of Israel. This is important because everything in the Bible centers around Israel in the Middle East. All the countries we're talking about center around Israel in the Middle East. Well, it turns out there's this quartet that's been around for a while, sometimes called the quartet the Diplomatic Quartet, or the Madrid Quartet, or simply the Quartet, a foursome of nations, international and supranational entities, involved in mediating the peace process in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In other words, the ones that would declare the peace treaty of Israel, right? In the seven-year peace treaty, does it sound familiar? Well, the, it's being negotiated by something called the Quartet that came from the Madrid Conference in 1991. The current representatives are, from the United Kingdom, the special envoy, Tony Blair. Now, Tony Blair was the spokesman. 
from the United Nations, Robert Seary, which he replaced Ban Ki-moon, who was doing it before that. The European Union had a high, is their high representative, Frederica Mogherini. The United States is now the Secretary of State, John Kerry, which, who was there before John Kerry, of course, was Hillary Clinton. And then Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. So this is the group that's been negotiating the peace treaty. Do these guys start to look familiar to you? You don't make this stuff up, folks. This is truly happening. The Madrid Quartet looks a whole lot like the Beasts of Daniel. The problem is Britain wasn't in it, except Tony Blair, of all people, was the spokesman. And we'll see, why do you think Tony Blair was the spokesman? And you'll, as we'll look forward, do you guys remember from the Beast, it had a mouth like a what? A mouth like a lion. Who's the lion? So the United Kingdom. So can you see the Beast speaks English? So this is the Middle East Quartet. China wanted to join the Middle East Quartet in 2014. At the time when I brought it up, I said it'll never happen. You know why it'll never happen? Because it's not in the Bible. You say, well, where's China in all this? Remember, China's got nothing to do with the Middle East. And it's all about the Middle East. And they tried to get into the quartet, but I knew they couldn't because biblically they don't match. Sure enough, they couldn't. The Middle East Quartet, U.S., Russia, the EU, and the United Nations with former British uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair. Now, Tony Blair, by the way, resigned in 2015, so Britain was out of it, right? But when U.S. and Britain joined back together, Britain's back in it, as the lion and the eagle together. Uh, from February, the Middle East Quartet renews the push for the two-state solution for the Palestinian conflict. They're the ones pushing the whole two-state solution, which came about in the Madrid conference in 1991. That's being pushed by this group of people. Can you see what's happening here? This is so biblical, it's amazing. So, yes, they're trying to push to divide the land of Israel. The U.S. and European, Russia, and the United Nations. Now, this is interesting. Said that they would prepare a report on the situation in Israel. They've been trying all these years to create the peace treaty which, by the way, is the thing that starts the seven-year countdown to the return of Christ, right? And the tribulation, you're familiar with that, right? That started with the peace treaty, and who's negotiating it? The beast. Which, of course, it says, because the Antichrist is going to be the one to approve the treaty, right? So it's very clear. But now, what's happening is the Middle East Quartet says can help inform inter. Uh, international discussions on the best way to advance the two-state solution. They're not talking about negotiating anymore. They're talking about pushing a two-state solution. So they're supposed to put out a plan that's due out in July to literally state what they're going to do. Why is that important? Well, by the way, Jordan's King Abdullah warned that uh, in international failure to make progress in the peace talks could lead to a religious conflict of global dimensions. Certainly could. Well, it just so happens it was released. So this is from, what, yesterday. Arab nations, quartet report biased in favor of Israel. As it turns out, the quartet has their report. The problem is both Israel and the Palestinians have rejected it. Does that matter? Could it be that they're going to force this anyway? All they got to do is turn Jerusalem into a UNESCO city, and you know, if you've seen the UN, who controls UNESCO now is Islam. So they want to turn it into an international city and control it. So you can see they're looking to force this solution on Israel. That's where we are. That's from yesterday. Now, why is this important? 
Well, it just so happens that jubilees are important in God's timing. And if you look at jubilees, they happen every 49 years. They're the 50th year after 49 years. But the 49 years is consistent. It always, you know, it, it, so it's every 49 years you have a jubilee. It turns out the first, uh, back in October 2nd, they had the Balfour Declaration, which created a Jewish state. That was in 1917. But actually, it was in 1918 by the Jewish calendar because it was after Rosh Hashanah. So it was actually in the year 5, 6, 7, 8. 49 years after that, that being a Jubilee year, just happened to be 1967 when Jerusalem's holy site was put under Jewish control. 49 years later on that Jubilee. Guess when this Jubilee is? We're in it, 2016. So something significant could very well happen before October, because the first of October is Rosh Hashanah. That's where we're living, folks. We're, that, we're in a critical time. Zechariah said, Behold, I make Jerusalem a cump of drunkenness, and all the surrounding people, when they lay their siege against Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall happen in that day that I'll make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all people, and all who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. So the whole world is trying to divide Jerusalem and trying to divide Israel. But it says what will happen is sarat, which means to be cut in pieces, to divide it up. In other words, you divide my land and my gosh, I'm going to divide yours. By the way, the quartet, besides being called the Middle East Quartet, was called the Madrid Quartet after the Madrid Conference when it started. From June 24th. Clock is ticking for a mega quake. The New Madrid seismic zone, right down the middle of the country, experts say it would impact seven states. Scientists now estimate that probability of magnitude six or larger earthquake in the seismic zone within any 50 year period is 25 to 40 percent. And an earthquake could hit the Mississippi Valley at any time. And it talks about the huge catastrophe that would happen if this New Madrid fault goes. So, Madrid Quartet, Madrid Fault, is there any coincidence? I hope it's a coincidence. But biblically, you divide my land, I'm going to divide yours. And God doesn't mess around. The beasts. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, who for one hour will receive authority as kings. What's going to happen is, this new world order is, that these kings don't have a kingdom. They're not kings. In other words, they're not over a, 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 a country right now. They're going to divide the world into ten parts and place ten people over the ten regions. But only for one purpose, to give their power and authority to the beast. Now, why do they do this? First of all, they want to tear down the, the national borders. They want the people to come independent so that they can control the people so they're going to tear down the nationalistic governments and the nationalistic borders so they're going to divide the world into ten areas and see if they can destroy the nations in there so that they can control them economically and through trade so you can see why they're doing it and then they're going to turn it over to the Antichrist because it becomes a one world government the thing I find interesting though is the trade unions because the whole goal of a free trade area is to put together a common external tariff so that you develop an external trade policy but it's for economic efficiency and economic integration so that you can control it as one head so you see they're trying to build these zones of things like NAFTA and the different trade agreements are to build the ten areas so that they can be ruled over without any national controls can you see what they're doing? The possible world trade regions. 
So can you see now that trade has become an important thing? Everybody's in favor of NAFTA and all the free trade. It's not free trade. What they're building is trade zones to destroy our national boundaries. They don't want national boundaries. The globalists don't. So question is, watch and pray. It appears that we have a nationalist and a globalist. Why would I call Hillary Clinton a globalist? Do you know what their foundation is? That's correct. It's the Clinton Global Initiative. It is a global initiative. So that's what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with the choice of a nationalist and a globalist. So can you see now, biblically, how this thing can play out? Do you think I'm making this thing up? Can, I mean, this is scripture I'm giving you guys, okay? And I hope that you can see that this stuff's in the Bible. So we got big things happening, and they're happening now, folks. This is not something where you stand by and decide, well, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. You need to get engaged. You need to get on your knees. You need to seek God and see what's going on. Because these things are biblical in proportion. And they're happening now. But when you see these things take place, straighten up, lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Father, that you've got a plan. How on earth, Lord, is how, how in the kingdom can you come up with this stuff and actually we can watch it happen before our very eyes? Your prophecies are amazing, Lord. We don't take it lightly that we're in very, very biblical times. For such a time as this, you've given us this wisdom and understanding. You said, Lord, let the wise understand this. Well, Lord, we want to be wise. We want you to show us what to do, Lord. We don't want to be as Peter who fought against your perfect plan. We want to follow your plan, Lord, and do your will. And Lord, if... if I, I know that there's exciting things happening, Lord, in your kingdom. I know there's great things happening in the world and the harvest is ripe. But show us what to do, Lord, and how to walk in these last days. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>